Focus your attention on the breath. Take a couple of good, long, deep in and out breaths and notice where you feel the sensation of breathing most clearly. When we talk of the breath, it's not necessarily the, the air, although that may be the prime thing you notice. It's more the energy in the body, the process of breathing itself. What is it that pulls the air in and allows it to go out? What movements of the chest, abdomen, shoulders do the breathing? And how do they do that? What's the energy flow in those parts of the body? If it feels tight, allow it to relax. Think of all the joints in your body relaxing. You might make a survey. Start with the joints in your toes and work up through the feet, the legs, up through the pelvis, up through the spine. Then starting with your fingers, coming up the arms, and eventually getting up through the neck and into the head. Think of all the joints relaxing. And now notice how you feel the breathing. Try to focus your attention on any spot where it's most obvious and where it feels easiest to stay focused. If you wander off, just keep coming back. This is called establishing mindfulness. In other words, you keep reminding yourself this is where you want to stay. And alertness. You want to watch what you're doing. So that if you wander off the breath, away from the breath, you know immediately. Come right back. While you're with the breath, try to be alert to how it feels. And if there are any ways you can improve it. This quality of alertness is really important. You're watching the breath, but you're also watching the mind watching the breath. It's like hiring someone to watch over your things and then hiring someone else to watch over the watchman. This is one of the most important skills in your meditation, because otherwise you can wander off for long periods of time and have no idea how it happened, or even that it is happening. All of a sudden, whoops, you, were, you had meant to stay with the breath, but you've gone off and we're tallying something else, tomorrow's plans. The alertness is what allows you to catch yourself quickly and to come right back. And the work of being really sensitive for the breath is helpful in this way, because the more you're exploring the subtle sensations of the breathing, the more interested you are in the present moment, the less likely you are to drop it and go off to someplace else. This quality of alertness is something we develop all the way through the path. It's related to the duties of the Four Noble Truths. But the cause of suffering, you want to abandon it. And the cessation of suffering, when you actually do put an end to suffering, is when you see the abandoning of, of craving, which is the cause of suffering. So that's a double duty right there. There's the abandoning and then seeing the abandoning. And that's tricky. That's a very subtle skill. We have to work at it from the very beginning. That's so why when the Buddha was teaching his son, who was seven years old at the time, told him, watch your actions. Look at why you're doing something, look at the results you're immediately getting, and look at the results over the long term. And if you see that you've, you're planning to do anything that's going to be harmful, well, don't do it. But even with actions you think will not be harmful, while you're doing them, notice if any unexpected harm comes up. And if you see it, stop. You don't see any harm happening, continue with the action until it's done. And then after it's done, look at the long-term results. And many times we'll complain, well, how do you know the long-term results of something you did a while back? It's partly because the mind observing is part of the thing you're trying to train. And John Chai has a nice passage where he talks about how you're coming here to observe the precepts, to meditate. And this function of the mind as the observer is something you're going to have to develop. And the problem is this observer, what has it been doing? If you haven't been observing the precepts before, well, the observer is what's been telling you not to 
bother about the precepts. It's been part of the mind that's been giving the orders to do things that are unskillful. So what you're doing is you're catching a thief and putting him in charge of law enforcement. Now there's an advantage here because sometimes thieves know the ways of their thievery, but at the same time they're dishonest. So it takes a while to train them so that they can really be trustworthy in observing what's going on. So the Buddha has you start with observing very blatant things, like when you're being generous. He says, observe that. What are the motivations? What are the results of being generous? So you begin to see that being generous really is a good thing. Honest behavior really is. Helpful behavior really is a nice thing to do. Then you also see what's going on in the motivations of the mind. Why are you being generous? Some of our motivations for being generous are open and above board, and others are less so. You want to watch for that. The same with the precepts. You watch the process of deciding not to kill, say, a little bug, not to steal something, even when it's easy to take little things. You watch yourself not doing that. When you're tempted to lie, you watch yourself not lying. If you slip and tell a lie, well, notice that. Notice the results. When you realize that you don't have to lie, that there are other ways of speaking that don't put you at a disadvantage, but you're not misrepresenting the truth, watch that and then notice the results. If you have any kind of addiction, watch yourself not giving in to it, and then watch the long-term results. Do it as an experiment. And this way you develop this ability to train the observer, to train this quality of alertness. At the same time, you're beginning to exercise the fact that you have freedom of choice. Say with the addiction, you might say, well, I just can't resist it. You say, well, it's an experiment. Give it a try. This is one of the reasons why we start with generosity, because generosity is one of the first places we notice that we do have freedom of choice. We've got something and we can keep it if we want, or we can give it away. And you realize that it's best to make the choice to give it away, how it feels good inside, and the benefits that come outside as well. So you're training yourself, yourself on the one hand to exercise freedom of choice so that when the mind picks up something or does something, you realize that you don't have to continue with it if it's not skillful, if it's causing any stress or harm. You can let it go. You do have that freedom. And at the same time, you begin to notice the results of your actions, the results of your choices. The observer gets trained. And then you bring that trained observer in to watch over your meditation to watch the movements of the mind as they're staying with the object, the, the breath, and the movements of the mind when it's not staying with the breath. Because you want to learn how to see these choices you exercise. Even in the simple thing of forming a thought. We often have the feeling that these thoughts just come in totally unbidden and willy-nilly. But as you begin to resist them, as you stay with your object of concentration, you begin to notice more and more what are the processes of choice. When things arise in the mind, it's not just arising and passing away. There's a cause deeper inside, and there are stages in the process, stages where you're actually making a choice. There's a little stirring of energy someplace in the body, and you choose to decide either that's going to be a physical event or it's going to be a mental event. It's going to be a thought with a meaning. And then you could take it in all kinds of directions. You can take it into the future, take it into the past. You've got these choices, and you want to observe yourself making these choices. This is why we have to train the observer, because these choices come very quickly and they come very early on in the thought process. And sometimes you find it easy to let go of a particular thought. And other times it's harder. We've got to 
dig down a little bit deeper. Why are some things easier to believe than others? Are some things easier to let go of than others? What's the difference? That's when we begin to see where the craving is in the mind, the thoughts that you want to get involved with. Even though part of the mind may know better, there's another part that really wants to get involved. Okay, why is that? What's it getting out of these things? And when you see the reason, can you let go? Usually if you really see the reason, you see that it's something that's diluted. How do you recognize it? That it's diluted? Well, you've trained this observer. It's no longer the criminal that it used to be, no longer the deceitful person it used to be. It's learned to be more honest because it's seen the value of honesty, of noticing okay, you're doing this and it's not helpful. You'd be better off if you let it go. And if, as an experiment, you let it go, you see well, you know, it's really true. So try to develop this ability to engage in an action and observe yourself in the course of the action. Because that's an ability that will take you far.